Um, yep. First thing I start out with is Bill Tucker threw out some terms this morning about how selection is happening in beef cattle, and we've heard about it in dairy cattle and in swine. And the first thing I'll tell you is, folks, we're generations behind all three of those industries. You know, how many of us go to the farm and pick the, to get specific. the nicest lamb, or she's out yeah. my best ewe, or she's my best ewe, and that's the one we take home. Just some there's things. too many sheep selected on that, and there's a lot of Say. technology out there that we can be and should be using. Uh, some of it for us as seed stock producers, produce, providing it to the you know, producers years. who should be used as commercial producers. Just to give you a little bit of background, there's been a lot of changes. Do we want to, is it help if we dim the lights a little bit? I don't know if, um, uh. thanks. Changes in U.S. agriculture, looking at those of us in the east and how the industry is shifting. Um, it's slowly leaving the west and the southwest is shifting towards the east. And a lot of that has to do with the ethnic farms in there. moving in and diversification of farms. People are looking for alternative income sources and with all of this, these ethnic groups coming in who are used to lamb and goat consumption, um, we're providing that. So we're shifting it. There's still the large flocks out there, but there's a lot of that population moving east to smaller flocks. The industry has also switched from wool to meat production. We used to have the wool incentive program and a lot of reasons for producing wool, a lot of use by the, the U.S. Army and the military, and that still occurs, but there's a lot more demand for the meat production. Again, a lot of it being driven by this ethnic and So, my question is... A lot of the is, meeting, the large operations that have declined, and with these smaller farms diversifying, sheep really fit in well with that. So... Another thing that's really helped us recently has been the weakened U.S. dollar because it's made it more expensive for that Australian lamb to be shipped in. So the, the suppliers of the lamb or the buyers of the lamb have looked more towards the domestic market with that more expensive Australian lamb. It's also the cause of, of more disposable income, of course, before the economic slump, but even for them. We've got affluential people looking to consume upper scale products and lamb meat falls into that. It's not the common 99 cent chicken that we have in the supermarket. It's a specialty product. Worldwide, sheep numbers have decreased. I don't know how many million it's been in Australia, Out. Out, but they've been really decimating flocks because of the droughts. So there's, there's a, a supply and demand issue. All of that because... And we have a lot of improved genetic tools that are av available to us that can be used to help us improve our efficiency and our profitability. Um, one thing that we really can look at is, is a rapidly increasing fossil fuel and grain prices, which have really impacted agriculture all around. Folks, we can do it with very little with the sheep industry. We, can, we don't we have to rely on like the swine industry and the poultry industry. We've got those forages out there. We've got an animal that finishes well on forages. Let's, let's take advantage of that. And we all need to become more efficient to survive. So what can we do? We need to produce a low input prolific flock. We don't need to be in the lambing barn 24 7 waiting for that next ewe to lamb. Go to the house, have a cup of coffee, she'll have it. If she doesn't, or if she has to get the. Down to being. Keep her up. Self insured. Get rid of her and keep the, keep the lambs from the ewe over here that dropped her twins or triplets, fed them, raised them, and you didn't have to do a thing for them. So we really need to reduce our input costs. And that's really a disservice that the sheep industry has done to itself, thinking that we have to be there, we have to pull the lambs, we have to just... There are problems, there are years with problems, but in general, we can really, with some hard selection, we can really improve ourselves that way. We need to increase the output value of our product. Um, some of us are doing that with direct marketing, farmer's market, slaughter. Uh, you might be making snack sticks or, or chorizos, or there's all kinds of things you'd be making with your product rather than just shipping it through the local auction. Uh, less reliance on fossil fuels and grain, less labor at lambing time, and then what we need to prepare for is profitability during high and low lamb prices. You know, lamb prices have been pretty good the last few years. There's been a drop here in the last six months, but even so, compared to historically, they're still very, very good. We should be making money now because the prices are high. What if the prices drop? Are you prepared for that? So we've had this bigger is better paradigm, and certainly the sheep isn't uh, the one that's been immune or uh, affected by that. The cattle and everybody else, and you know, we've had this real dichotomy in the sheep industry, where we've got the show industry and we've got the commercial industry, and there's really not a lot of happy middle ground. This group doesn't do well here, and this group doesn't do well here in, in general. So I think we need to find that happy medium and, and make sure we're getting animals that suit our system. We've selected for a larger and larger body frame. Certainly a show ring influence, but also the Midwestern lamb demands a larger lamb than what the Eastern market demands. So it's going to require different genetics to supply that demand. So, you know, a lot of our lambs are sold directly from the used side. I wean them onto the truck. 
and they go to the auction and they're going into Greek Easter markets or Ramadan yep. markets or whatever the local market, the current, in the first and we're lambing in sync with those markets. Yeah, that's the nice thing about our breed anyways, yep. our sets is we can lamb whenever we want. Everybody says, well, when do you have lambs? I said, five months after we put the rams in. Yep. So yeah, you back it up five months from where you were and plus whatever time you throw them out for whatever size. So we're not raising out those lambs. We don't have to raise out those lambs to a slaughter weight. You can if that's your market, but you don't have to. If you're not raising out those point. lambs, you have less parasite issues, and you also can carry more use on that same property because you're not raising out those lambs. And then there's uh, the non-traditional buyers. You know, they want a specific size sex body type. That some of them want an intact ram lamb that doesn't have its tail cut. With, they'd like to have no ear tags. With the scraping regulations, we can't do that. They want them unaltered. But you know, there's very specific uh, demands for some of them for different groups. The non-traditional buyers are the ethnic buyers. There's different terms for it. Want those round butterball lambs, between 40 and 100 pounds live weight. These are, I, I, I won't call them the same breed, one of them is mine, one of them is not. You can guess which is which. Um, but they, are within, they fall within the same breed registry. Yeah, can you can be registered in the same breed. But when you're looking at what our ethnic buyers want, they want these little round 50, 60, 70 pound butterball round lambs. They're not looking for something with a lot of frame on it because these sheep are still putting on frame, putting on bone, putting on a little bit of muscle, not putting on the fat, and there's not a lot there at that age. They're going to finish out at a later date at a higher weight Maybe or maybe not with more muscling than what this lamb does. So we're really looking at a different type of animal than what has been historical with the Midwestern markets. So um, if we're looking for larger framed lambs, which is what people have wanted and what the show industry has demand, to get those lambs, we have to have larger frame use. Larger use eat more. But are they producing more pounds of lamb to make up for that greater amount that they're eating? So I have an example that was given to me by Melanie Barkley. She put this together. She's an extension agent in Bedford, Pennsylvania. And she took an example of two different ewes, a 154-pound ewe and a 308-pound ewe, and yes, they are out there. Um, if I'm going to raise something that size, I'm going to go to cattle. So, but anyway, they are out there. So looking at, at pound, dry matter intake in pounds and as a percentage of body weight, the larger ewe is going to eat less as a percentage of her body weight, but she's going to eat more pounds of feed because she's bigger. Bar so we're going to assume that we're grazing for six months and feeding hay for six months. So if this smaller ewe is eating 2.6 pounds of, of feed for 182 days, we're feeding her in the, in the hay feed lot. That's 473 pounds of hay, and I put in a value of $150 per ton for hay. So she's costing us 35 Some cents. That same 308 pounds is $59. Whatever no matter That's a difference in $1.64 per ewe for that six month winter feeding period. If we're feeding 100 ewes, there's a difference in feed costs. Um, we, it's gonna cost us another $2,300 for well. the 308 pound ewes and it will be those 154 pound ewes. So if we take that one step further and look at lamb, what, what do we have to, how much more lamb do we have to sell to cover those feed costs? We put a value of $1.50 a pound for lamb. So if we have uh, 20, that $2,300 difference divided by $1.50, we need another 1,500 pounds of additional Do some of these, to cover uh, that additional uh, $2,100 in feed costs. That's an additional 15 pounds of lamb per ewe. Can we do that? Maybe. But are we producing the right type of lamb with that larger frame lamb? We may take that larger frame lamb and that smaller frame lamb, and this one might weigh more, which so you're going to get a little bit less per pound than you with a smaller lamb. But if that ethnic buyer down at the New Holland PA auction or whatever auction it is likes this round lamb, they're going to pay a lot more for it. We've gotten $3.50 a pound for a 50, 70 pound lamb at auction. So you, it's hard to beat that. I mean, we've, we've had our bombs too at the auction yard, but if you hit it right, you can hit it really well. Plus, a lot of those larger frame ewes require supplementation. Uh, a lot of those moderate frame ewes, we don't grain anything except the ewes that have triplets after lambing. And they're, they're lambing right now, so they'll get grain. They'll get about a pound, pound and a half of corn plus alfalfa hay till they go on pasture in April. Then they get nothing but pasture. <laughs> Those larger frame ewes may not have the gut capacity to development in order to do that on a forage diet. So what's that going to cost us at six, seven, eight dollars corn? And then what about the additional pasture and or hay that you need to purchase for those animals? If they're eating more, you need greater no. carrying capacity or more land to feed those animals. You need to tell. So they may or may not wean a larger lamb on similar feed. If I'm taking them on a similar diet, let's say a mostly forage or an all forage diet. 
So now that the corn ha prices have changed, does that change our model? And no. especially in our eastern markets, I think it really does change it with the, with the cost of uh, with the cost of corn. Uh, and we have a lot of marginal land. I mean, we have a lot of it in Pennsylvania. Now. I certainly know you have it here in West Virginia that you can't get it. Oh, with the you can't you can certainly put an animal in it and let them graze it off. The box is your wills in. It takes a court order to open it upon your death. So it's a difference between when you're raising sheep on grass of living on grass or just standing on grass. Talk about who's going to care for the cows and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, so it's really a matter of what are you looking at. You know, when you look at these animals, and, and I didn't put that slide in here, but if you draw a box, around the animal, cut the head and neck off, and you draw a box, and then you draw a line where that animal is, how much of that box did the animal fill up? Forage is a lot of fiber. Fiber is a lot of gut fill. If this animal doesn't have the capacity to take in enough nutrients, it's not going to do well on a forage-based system. You have to feed it a nutrient-rich diet, which includes grains, and I don't want to pay seven or eight dollars a bushel for corn for an animal whenever I can do something like this on all forage. That ram had never seen green in his life. So what can we do about it? The first thing we can do is set production benchmarks and goals. And this could be a whole new talk in itself. Um, but I've just kind of summarized some points based on that. Some Get away from each other and respond. For your own operation. We need to develop a marketing plan. You know, somebody says, well, what breed should I get? Or should I get this over that? And, and I asked uh, David right here, I said, well, what's your goal? What do you want to sell? That and then start backing it up. You know, if you want to sell this type of product, this type of product, this breed or this type of animal may do better than another one. But you need to produce the type of sheep that meets that market. You need to analyze your consumer and know, know where you're selling. Use the available tools for measuring flock production. There's a lot of tools out there that we're not using. Um, NSIP, National Sheep Improvement Program, and Land Plan is the EPD or EBV program for sheep. I'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. Use performance tested rams that it may come out of a RAM test, or it may come out of a, a home test, or it may come out of, you know, performance testing can include these EBVs as well. And if you're interested in wool, you're going to want some wool measurements, some objective wool measurements on those animals as well. Um, improve carcass quality for those of us producing meat. Decrease time to slaughter so that we're feeding them less and, and it's costing us less. And improving disease resistance. We have foot rot issues, parasite issues, and there's some, some things coming on the horizon that may help. Without the real resistance to these diseases and others uh, will include the DNA testing. So why set benchmarks? Uh, why, why do we, money. we want to improve our efficiency, which will improve our profitability. We need to set some goals, meet those goals, and then try to exceed those goals as well. Different types of benchmarks, there's, there's all kinds of them you can set for yourself. Some major categories can be production or performance. How are the animals performing? Uh, yeah. Reproduction, are they rebreeding? Are they lambing? Are they raising the lambs? Are they losing the lambs? Health benchmarks, nutrition, marketing, and financial. If we start with the production and keep uh, things like birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, um, a birth weight can be important because as we select animals for larger weaning and yearling weights, we're going to get larger frame sizes. We could be increasing the birth weight as well. And the beef industry found that out the hard way when they were selecting really hard for higher weaning weights and higher growth rates. Suddenly they were having trouble getting those calves out of those cows because the birth weights were so high. A carcass measurements, looking at fat thickness and loin eye depth or area, uh, depending on what you're, which program you're using. Uh, you can do that. There's some people that are doing that. Um, there's a few more coming along. It's not done real commonly, but it is a tool we can use or that you can ask of a seed stock producer if they are using. And then wool production traits. Reproduction, what's your conception rate? Uh, how many ewes are lambing? Uh, based on what's been exposed. Your lambing percent, you know, how many ewes per lamb that lambed, how many ewes, or how many lambs per ewe that were exposed. And that's, that's actually a more important thing. You say, oh, I had a 200% drop. Well, is that of the ewes that lambed or the ewes that were exposed? You know, if I had four ewes, if I exposed 10 ewes and five of them lambed with twins, I could call that a 200% or I could call that a lot hey, more based on which. The fixed fence or whatever. Ewes. Uh, what's your lambing time period? You know, if you're looking at labor efficiency, some people let rams in all year round and have surprise lambs here and there. That makes it hard to market. If you're marketing groups of animals, you'd like a nice uniform group, a nice tight lambing group. I like to see 80 to 95 percent of my used lamb within that first cycle when the ram's exposed. Build more with the house. That and I that? don't keep replacements for those who lamb during that second cycle or third if we end up leaving it there. So you 
I have done two and three week lambings, and if you don't lamb during then, you're going dicey. But anyway, it's tough on our farm. Uh, it, it gets high. We laugh that if they look cross-eyed at their lambs, they're gone, and, and they really are. Yeah. But we both hold off farm jobs, so we're not going to sit there and babysit them. And we want to produce an animal that can do that for our buyers. Look at your right. mortality percentages. Do you want to get below 10%, below 5%? What's the cause of your mortality? Is there something you can change in your management to prevent that? Is it from dystocia? Okay, do we have birth weight problems? Are we losing them in the first in a, hours, maybe in the jug or on pasture? Did we need crops here? Do we have a pasture on the problem or an E. coli problem or something? Are they not getting up and eating? Do the ewes have milk? So there's a lot of reasons why, but can we manage? Can we Let, identify the causes and reduce those losses? And what's the average age of the ewes? Do you have six, seven, eight, nine plus year old ewes in your flock, or are they all three years old? Because you've had to get rid of them because they prolapsed, or they didn't lamb, or they had foot rot, or they whatever okay. reason you got rid of them. What's the longevity? Ten years. The quicker you're turning them over, the more replacements you have to raise. Mm -hmm. Looking at health benchmarks, number of times to be warm. You know, some animals need deworm constantly, some don't. Same corn plant. Taking notes on, I didn't deworm this one, be for, but once a year, this one needed it five times a year. Well, the one needed it five times a year probably needs to be selecting genetically for sustain. resistant. Call your skin. I don't care why. Graph. If they don't fit my system, I don't sit there and try to figure out why. If there's one there that's skinny, she's gone. She doesn't need to be, and I mean, it could be something like a, an abscess tooth. She's gone because she just doesn't fit my skin. Looking at udder health. Two functional teats, free of lumps, and you don't have a real saggy, hanging down udder. We like They're smoking and joking and, and bigger udder doesn't necessarily mean more milk. So you don't have to, we like to see nice smooth teats because we've gotten some ewes that have had what we call cucumber teats. Lambs can get some around them and they can't nurse. If they don't nurse, they starve. I said to my partner. So that doesn't help us either. Structural correctness, mouth, testicles, feet, legs, you know, we just don't tolerate anything like that. The parrot mouths, the overshot, undershot jaws, uh, right. or hockey sheep, or too, too straight in the stifle. That use actually approaching that for me, I'd like to see a little bit more turn in her stifle. And I've seen a lot of sheep heading that way. And it is a functional issue just because they just can't travel as well as they should and they don't last as long. Very and then diseases, foot rot, casey's lymphitis, OPP, other diseases. When we, you know, we cattle that can do cattle and sheep. We want to reduce it, eliminate it, start a vaccine. Exactly Whatever. right. I wish I'd come up with this, but just thank you. Nutritional back benchmarks, how many grazing days per year do we have and how can we increase that? because that's our lowest cost feed. So how can we improve upon that? How can we improve upon our pasture quality, whether it be some fertilization, whether it be um, in, in doing some seeding, right. whatever it might be to improve our pasture quality. Might be right. running some additional land next door to us. How much grain are we feeding? And why are we feeding that much? And can we reduce that? And if, we, you, know, if you go to that, if you're feeding a lot of grain, you can't just stop it. Your, your flock's gonna crash. It's kind of, a, you can't just go cold turkey. Maybe try feeding two-thirds of it or half of it. A few years will fall out of the system, so be it. These are the ones you want to keep. Try it again the next year with a little bit less. And then look at your, if you're breeding ewe lambs to lamb at 10 to 12, 14 months of age, look at their weights at breeding. Um, we have gone away from breeding lambs. We don't lamb until they're 18 to 24 months old, primarily because of our forage-based system. They're not maturing quite as quickly. But we'd like to see them, 65% of them mature weight at breeding time before we would breed them. Because otherwise, they can breed later than that, they can lamb later than that, but their bodies just aren't always as mat mature enough to handle that pregnancy, especially if they have twins in them. And you can run into issues with the associate because of small pelvises or prolapses. Marketing benchmarks. Uh, what's the percent land sold off the farm for various reasons, whatever your markets are, if it's custom harvest, breeding stock, um, direct marketing, uh, medical research purposes, whatever your market of is. What, how can we increase the expensive part of our 10% to this market? No. The value added market as opposed to sending them to the local auction. For those of you who are meat animals, looking at minimum carcass characteristics. Now, uh, it's not all going to be out there ultrasounding, but purchase animals that have been tested. If you're buying a ram and you're using him on your flock, that's 50% of the genetics of your next generation. You need to put an investment into that and not just buy the local one or I could borrow him because he was free or the neighbor let me have it. He jumped the fence and bred my ewes. Of course, that happens. You can't, you can't really stop it, but you can, can uh, maybe build a better fence. And also, look at your marketing cost. What's it costing me to transport? Is it worth me hauling for us, you know, New Holland is two, two and a half hours away. Is it worth me hauling them to New Holland, or should I take them to the local auction, get a few cents less? They're going to go through New Holland anyway, the next sale. 
but I only have to go 40 miles. So there, there's costs and benefits. It depends on the market. <coughs> Financial benchmarks, uh, what's your benchmark for you? Uh, that includes everything, feed, health. Um, I, I would say direct cost, not necessarily capital investment or land, but looking at your production cost per year to, to raise her and, and manage her for, and her lambs for the year. What's the cost to raise your lambs? Raising lambs in December or yeah. February is a lot different than raising them in April or May. They all have their different issues, but you have to look at, at what's best yeah. for your markets and for your costs. I talked about death loss, to, uh, and then of course the bottom line is what's your net profit. So what you need to do is match the benchmarks to your type of sheep. You can't suddenly say, oh, I want my used to wean 80 pound lambs at 75 days when they've been doing 50 pound lambs at 75 days. It's going to be a progression. Maybe you set it at 10% above that or something that, that's realistic. Meet that goal, set a new benchmark. You need to optimize your resources. What do I have available to me? Does the neighbor want me to graze their five acre field that doesn't have? Does the neighbor who has the, the vacant 200 acre farm beside me, well, what if I asked him if I could just graze this section against my fence and you know just jump a net fence off of my hot wire and see what happens? And a lot of times people are amicable to that. And, you can get it for low or sometimes no cost. And you need to set realistic goals. So some of the tools that are available out there, um, if we're looking to buy a car Video. or a tractor, Letter. what questions do you ask? The motor looks big. The tires look good. I like the owner. He's really cool. That. I like the color. So I need somebody to say about color. I there's no dents in it. It started, so it's got to be good, right? Might have used ether, but we got it started. The radio works, yeah. So, uh, you know, when you're last, are these the kind of questions you ask when you're buying equipment? Why are we asking these kind of questions when we buy sheep? When we're buying our genetics. Oh, the owner said it's the best he's ever owned. Take pride in her. I've heard that about her. This is the best ram out of, out of my best you. What do you. How do you define best? The only one can prolapse in a flock? I, mean, I don't know what best is. Or are you asking questions like how many miles per gallon? What's the horsepower rating? How many miles um, an hour can it go if it's, a, if it's a car? And what options are on it? There's a who said radio. Yeah, what options are on it? You're making an informed decision. And that's what we need to do when we're purchasing our breeding stock as well. Not just, oh, he looks pretty, or I like him, or he survived. But what's, the, what's under the hood of that animal? So why not buy our rams with a, with a horsepower rating? So if we pick them with EPDs or EBVs, expected progeny, and, and Bill did a great job of explaining the differences this morning. So if we're looking for growth, paternal, carcass, wool, whatever your goals are, versus an animal that doesn't have anything, we're doing a, making an informed decision versus a gamble. This, this ram might do better than this ram, but we don't know. We don't know how he's going to perform. So we can expect to produce some money with him, probably. But we should be able to expect more to produce more money with a ram that has this information behind him. So we can't judge per performance on looks alone. You know, there's my soapbox with the with the show industry. One person's opinion on one day, based on phenotype, and that's it. So how can we be selecting our animals based on that? So how, can, how can what can we do with genetic prediction tools? Um, it's ability to focus on traits of the greatest economic importance, and that's what's nice. You can pick which traits are important to you. It doesn't have to be the whole gamut of them. If you're raising Catons, you don't care about wool traits. If you're raising Suffolk, you don't. You know, you, there's just different things that you need to look at to do that. And it helps us become overcome genetic antagonisms. I can't get okay. weights over such and such. Well, let's look at a ram that has a weaning weight EPV that's high and. Maybe he can help us do that. We can gain genetic uniformity in a flock, and I have really seen that in our flock. I mean, our, our lambs come out like peas in a pod now. And it used to be you'd have big ones, little ones, this and that, but they're, they're like peas in a pod now. We can create greater genetic reach and sire selection. We can use the same ram on different farms and get genetic lenses doing that. We can more quickly adapt to changes in the market and the environment, and Australia has really done this. They've taken their EBVs through lamb plan. They were getting their lambs too lean. And so there wasn't enough fat cover, and when they were shipping them overseas, the carcasses were drying out too much. So they backed off on that on the uh, the post weaning fat. Eating Think about that. Or reversed their selection on it to produce fatter lambs, not 
fat, fat lamps, but put more cover on them so that they didn't lose as much burning overseas when they were hanging on the rail. They were already started. They do last year. Yeah. So, uh, there's really things we can do to adapt. That's if we didn't have that information, how would they have adapted to that market change or that need? So why do we performance record? And this might be taking well, you pull your bull and and using adjusted weights up to the EPD. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Because it's difficult to find the superior animals within the flock. If I go out into a flock, if I come over to your flock and I want to pick a ram and, and you show me a bunch of them, I pick the biggest one. What am I most likely to pick? A big single, right. Is that what I necessarily want? I mean, it might not be, but we don't know. Yeah, that's right. And it's also to remove envir environmental influence. If I raise lambs now, and let's say I creep feed them and I grain the mamas and, and we wean them at 60 days and then I lamb again in April with another group and they're on pasture with no feed and I wean them at 90, 60 or 90 days, I probably wean them a little later. At 60 days, which group's going to be bigger? The February group because I fed them. Does that make them genetically superior? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. So it helps us select replacement animals at a younger age as well, especially for these ethnic markets. I can't wait to let them grow out to 8, 10 months. If I want to sell them as 40-pound you know, suckling lambs into the Greek Easter market, how do I select them at that age? How do I know which ones are going to be superior and which ones not? I can take, cost. Get an inch pass, take off those bottom percent and ship them, and I don't have to raise them out any further. If you don't measure it, you can't manage it. I, I like that mantra, and I use it all the time. So there was a UK study where they did 4,700 matings over four seasons with these breeds, and they had two, two uh, different groups. There was a high and a low index terminal sire. Oh. So they had you know, those that indexed really high and those that were indexed really low, and they genetically selected them for that. And then what they wanted to look at was the resulting lambs, and they evaluated the, the consequence on finishing and marketing of the crossbred lambs. One of my neighbors, an, uh, an accountant, it's a uh, farmer and his accountant wife. Feeding them less, uh, uh, fewer days, greater carcass weight, greater saleable meat yield, but they did have lower meat tenderness. Um, but, um, that was a byproduct of the study, and I don't want to focus on, but there was a, a, a downside to that. Maybe the fast growth rates weren't, weren't the bonus for that. But anyway, the lambs in and high index rams were worth $10 more each. So if a lamb sire, if a ram sire is 500 lambs over his lifetime, that's an additional $500 mm. income. So how much can you afford to pay for a ram if you're getting an additional $500 in income over him? Or $5,000, I'm sorry, $5,000, $5,000 income. So can, what can you afford, you know, a $200 ram? You can probably afford to pay start with 500 the, for a ram like that if he's going to produce another 5K in income. So, and if you kept, if you kept some, some replacement lambs out of that ram, what's their value? And what's the value of their offspring in your flock? That's hard to put a number on. That's really tough to put a number on. We can put a number on the, on the market animals, but what about those mamas that are back in your county? So I just want to mention the genetic evaluation programs really quickly. The National Sheep Improvement Program is the U.S. EBV program for sheep, and there's the website if anybody's interested. And I can go into detail. Bill explained that really quickly this morning, and I don't want to dwell on it. And uh, Lamb Plan is the Australian Genetic Improvement Program. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, NSIP kind of floundered for a while with funding and some other issues. And a couple of years ago, they went under contract with Lamb Plan to run their data. I've been with Lamb Plan since 2000, so I've had my data run with them. I used to get just flock EBVs because I was in the middle of all the self-driving sheep and didn't have any genetic links, so they couldn't get, get me those cross-flock EBVs. But now we're on we now we're NFP turn? is combined with them. I'm still with Lamb Plan, but my data is now being run with the U.S. Dorset database. So I'm getting cross-flock EBVs. So if I send a, a ram into your flock and you're also on it, I can see how my ram performs in your flock and get feedback through the EBVs. So it's a computerized genetic selection of sheep based on performance. Um, expected breeding value, um, I won't, and it's just this, it takes out the environmental component and strictly looks at just looks. So the, it expresses the difference between an animal, an individual animal and a benchmark to which the animal is being compared, a flock average or a cross flock average, right. depending on whether you have flock or cross flock EBVs. So if we have an animal with an EBV of plus 10, mm -hmm. plus weaning weight, that means this animal is genetically Program to produce lambs that are five pounds heavier because only half of the genetics are coming from that. Call me. At, 
at there's the office number, right. than the base to which it's being compared. So if, if it was my just flock EBVs, I'd be five pounds heavier than my flock average. And, eight. and it adjusts for all these known factors that we can't when we're looking at, at a group in a, in a pen. We don't know, you know, the, the age of the lamb, the age of the dam, the sex of the lamb. Uh, the, Yep. I do have one here. here. Um, nutrition management group and um, and the birth and rearing type. If it was born a triplet, raised a triplet, born a triplet, weight raised a twin, whatever uh, it happened to be. So as I mentioned earlier, it allows for comparison of those animals that I was born in February versus born in April. I can compare them on an apples to apples basis. And, it, and the, the neat thing about EBVs is it includes the data from all the relatives in that flock. So the historical and, and if if you know he's got my animals and his flock, and we've got cross-flock EBVs that will compare in different management environments. So it'll give me an idea how the animals are performing in another environment. And um, so it, it's really neat. It, it, it's a really powerful tool. It's not something everybody needs to be using themselves in the sheep industry, but if you're buying rams from a seed stock producer, you should be looking for those that are producing these, these numbers. So it's the best estimate of the genetic merit of the animal because we can't directly measure the animal's genes. So we have to settle for the best estimate. So, but we can get accuracies that are very, very high. And so you know, we have a fairly confident that this is how that animal will perform in another environment. So what are we doing with EPDs? Where are we on time? We're going until what, 2.30? Uh, we were enrolled in land plans since 2000. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we now have cross-flock EBV since we went, since uh, NSIP and land plan contracted with each other to run the database. So what are we watching? We are uh, measuring or watching birth weights. We're not actually selecting, but I'm making sure those birth weights aren't going up so we don't have issues. Weaning weight, post-weaning weights, mature weight. If you start selecting for higher numbers here, your mature weight might start climbing up, and we don't want that to happen. We've had them too small, we've had them too big. We've got a happy meeting, we want to keep it that way. We're looking at numbers of lamb born and numbers of lamb weaned. We're really emphasizing this, but I want to know what this is too to see if she's losing lambs. If she's having triplets and losing one to here, I want to know that. If she has them, I want her to be raising them. And then maternal weaning weight, and this is a combination of the growth and milk potential of the ewe. And then we're also looking at, we do ultrasonomy for loin eye depth. And then we're not selecting for, we're just kind of watching the back fat thickness just to see how it, how it, and I don't care. You can, how it's changing with our, and uh, work, work. so looking at where we were, we started, um, we started in 2000, around 2000, so I had some older data, so we, land plan let us put in back data, so I had some birth weights and weaning weights and whatnot for the sheep, so we could put in all that back data, which really helped us, and we've got, from our flock alone, I think we've got 14 or 1500 individual animal uh, data sets right now from just from our flock. So we started around 2000 and you can see we're kind of all over the board here and the reason for that was is I wasn't buying performance recorded rams because I couldn't find them. So I was buying from production oriented flocks kind of picking the best of their best with what tools I had available and you can see what happened. I had some winners, I had some losers. So, we, so at this point we started using only performance recorded rams. And it wasn't, it wasn't long, I mean, it just made a dramatic difference. Um, you know, we've increased our, our weaning weight and our, our post-weaning weight, but like I said, we're watching birth weight and we're watching yearling weight. Our yearling weight has started to climb a little bit. I don't want that to keep continue. If I have to, I'll start sele put selection pressure on yearling weight to get that mature weight back down to where I want it, because I don't want to start growing bigger sheep. Maternal EBDs, we have maternal The state law says you your stuff at home. Anyway, we've really been able to influence. There's, there's a lot of milk potential in that. It's the milk production plus the growth of the uh, uh, potential of the ewe. And these reproductive traits, Bill put some nice numbers on how low the heritability is. They're hard to move. They're not going to move very fast, but we're, we're still watching it and we're still selecting with the differences. The relative difference within the flock is very, very low. So it, it, um, you just have to watch. If you get a real outlier, then maybe you don't keep that animal. Loin eye depth has gone up for us since we started selecting and started uh, selecting four animals and using rams that um, are also measured. And so the future with what we're doing with EBVs and R is artificial insemination because it's been so hard to find performance recorded rams that also have the phenotype and management that I want because a lot of the NSIP flocks are very intensively managed. They're managed like a small farm flock with a lot of grain, a lot of external feed 
that we don't want. So I, even though the EPDs are there, it's not necessarily what I want. It's only one tool. So we want to establish Agent genetic file. blocks, which we are document. Doing. Write your agent along. We have imported semen from England twice, which has not helped us get flock, cross blocky. Am I covered? And to what degree? I talk numbers, and those guys blew my yeah. mind with the numbers they were talking. They took me into their offices. They were talking numbers at the show. EPDs, what they scanned for lambing percentage at the show. How many shows have you heard that discussed in the United States? I don't care what species, pick your species, but especially in the sheep. Um, so, um, uh, to do that. England border is shut down right now, definitely. Small, small ruminant germplasm. And, ship, so, and everything's just. I'm going to go to Australia, which would give me cross block links with the lamb plan. Blocks down there. One of um, looking, oh, we've been using. Let's buy rams because when I was looking at those EPDs, those purchased rams that didn't have the EPDs, my ram lambs were outperforming them. So I couldn't go back to that flock because I didn't know if I'd go forward or go backwards if I got another. Mm -hmm. We're trying to convince other purebred breeders to use EBVs, and we're, we're getting a lot more of our buyers, purebred and commercial, asking about EBVs. You know, I want to see the numbers. I want to, can you explain the numbers to me? Okay, I understand the numbers, and they're selecting based on that. On that. So we're getting a lot more information, a lot more information out there on the use of EBVs with uh, sheep producers. And we want to maintain a high production performance confirmation and breed type standard. Um, our goal is to produce a, a, a well-balanced, easy-keeping foundation animal that can go into either a seed stock or a commercial flock and do its job for you. So should everyone be performance testing? Does everybody need to sign up with Land Plan or NSIP? Mm -mm. No. These are know how to use them. Ask them of the people you're buying sheep from. That, that equals your investment in the co-op. Ask them what's under the hood. You know, back to those questions of what we're asking for buying a tractor or a... Um, so I want to give you an example of two rams that one is uh, some economic numbers of two rams, one with EPDs and one without. So if we're looking at, and, and these numbers vary, current land prices at $1.72 per pound. Uh, so you're looking at like $220, $220, $250 $2 for a market lamb. So can, can I afford, I get calls all the time, do you have a, a breeding ram? Of course, you know, he's got to be a twin, fall born, uh, whatever else they want to add to it. Do you have one for 200 bucks? Nope. I send a new Han for $250, and I'm not going to hear back from somebody next year when he doesn't work for you. He went you know, into the meat market. At a dollar six. And, you know, as I said, when I can ship them for that I mean, price, I'm not, I can't afford to sell seed stock with everything we have invested in them. And it's possible. That's what happened. Or each time we even AI, so it's an investment. X and it just goes. On. These two rams, one was six dollars, one was two hundred dollars. Not atypical for for ram prices. This one's performance recorded has EBVs. This one's a twin out of my best. Lots. Yep. And that's what I bought him one. So the one has the, the one that's recorded has a weaning weight EBV of eight pounds, which means his offspring will wean four pounds heavier than the full average. We produce fifty lambs out of them at four pounds heavier, two hundred dollars of additional lamb to sell. So if we sell those lambs for a buck and a half a pound, we've got a $300 additional income, but what, did, what input do we have? What? Nothing additional. We bought a ranch, just which ram we used. Right. You have that twin. And the twin out of the best you. He had some data, but no adjusted weights or EBVs or anything. He ended up weaning lambs that were four pounds lighter than my average. So we had 200 pounds less lamb to sell. So we had a loss of $300 for the 50 lambs, but I'm out $500 because I paid $200 for that bugger. Now I'm going to ship him to auction because he didn't produce the it. was worth anything to keep. So if I use Ram A, who's the performance recorded ram for two years, get two lamb crops out of them, that's an additional $600 income. Ooh, wait, what did I pay for that ram? I just covered the cost of that ram. So he didn't cost me anything because I got it back in lamb income. But wait, there's one more. If I hit the right button. Did you keep replacements out of them? I mentioned this before. If I kept replacements who are genetically superior and producing more pounds of lamb and their daughters produce more pounds and their daughters. So we're, how do we get value on it? Probably. That's tough. But it's there and it's a real value. But of us, I don't So we have these two rams. We have here. $100 for $200. And so face value, ram B appeared to be a better value, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But ram mm -hmm. you probably was a bargain. So you need to think about that, you know, when people say, I don't want to pay more than $150, $200 for a ram, and I get that all the time. I'm going to ship lambs to, to, to auction. I'm going to go to New Holland before, I'll, before uh, I can afford uh, to sell them that way. Mark. So other tools that are out there, 
uh, artificial insemination. I'm, gonna or that we've I'm got just going to touch on DNA testing because we're, we're, we're doing a little bit of it, some, some new things on the forefront that are coming. Uh, so why would you AI? Um, for those that aren't familiar with AI in sheep, it's not near as simple as it is in cattle because it's laparoscopic. You can't get through the cervix of the sheep very easily, so you can't get the semen into the uterus, so you have to go in laparoscopically. So you have to synchronize all the ewes, sit there and heat them the same day, keep the rams away from them because you know what they're going to want to do on that day when you get 100 ewes in heat, which our rams were shipped far away that day. <laughs> And, um, and then you have to have somebody who's qualified. It's not as easy as going and taking an AI class for cattle. It's a veterinarian or somebody who's trained to do that, and they come in and spend the day and do that with you. So it, why would you use AI in sheep? Well, to import genetics from other countries. Because especially from places like England, we can't bring in live animals even when the borders open. So it has to come in as semen. We can't bring embryos in. We can't bring live animals in. If you want to make rapid genetic improvement, use the same ram over different flocks, or you want to use them on a whole bunch of ewes at once, you, can, you, know, you can't expect him to cover all of them, you can use it then if you have a closed flock. Um, our flock has been closed for nearly 10 years. We haven't brought any live animals in for biosecurity reasons, and so if anyway, we bring in new genetics now to extend the use of a superior ram, either within your flock or across flocks. If you're sharing a ram or using genetics from across the country, if somebody in California has a ram I really want to use, doesn't want to sell them, or I don't want to ship them, we can, we can do that as well. So there's, there's a picture of the procedure. The ewes are put into a cradle. They're, they're kind of put in a, in a Superman pose, and then they're inverted so that their back legs are up so all the organs get pushed up, and then we can go in. And not a lot of the way it's done in humans, but um, that's the way it's done in sheep. It requires, it's a high investment, it's under $125 per year to put everything in it. So it's not a cheap investment. And the conception rates are typically 50, 60%. We had 77% the second time, but it made up for the first time when we had 22% conception rates. So, and I can talk about privately if anybody wants to know why. So we had semen motility problems with some of the hormones that we ended up having to use because we couldn't get what we needed. It does require hormonal synchronization. The cedars, um, there's a picture of Good. the pronouncement for sheep. They've been around for cattle for a long time. And then pregnant mare serum gonadotropin is what you use when you pull the cedar out to, to cause them to ovulate and then breed them about 52, 54 hours after you do that. So if they're, but the thing is, if you breed 100 ewes, you synchronize 100 ewes and you breed 100 ewes, what happens five months later on the same day? Or be to have a calf. They're all due on the same day. So you need to be prepared for that. And they're all going to land within a six to eight day window. So you just have to be, it's nice, you have a nice uniform flock, but by the end of that six to eight days, you're going crazy. And that was one of the times we did, we did keep vigil in the barn around the clock, primarily because we didn't want mix-ups. I didn't want three ewes lambing at once with six or seven lambs, and I go, oh, is that yours or is that yours? You know, from a pedigree standpoint, I'm, I'm done if that happens. So we did keep vigil at that point, but that was only for a few days. So it's not for everyone, but it's a consideration for quality and genetic improvements. And of course, commercial buyers can take advantage of those that do. There's some DNA testing that's now available. Um, scraping resistance testing has been around for a while. You know, oh. There's different uh, codons. There's the 171, which is commonly done in the US, but there's other ones, 131 and 154, that are done in other countries. But there's a lot of controversy now about eliminating that Q gene. Um, we like to see the R, the RR resistance. Uh, the Q, you can get the QQ, QR, and RR for those who aren't familiar. RR means they're resistant to scrapie. QQ means they're susceptible. It doesn't mean they have it, but it means they're more susceptible, genetically susceptible. And this is intermediate. And I have found, truthfully, that we had selected for RR for a while, but some of my growthier, nicer lambs were actually QR. So I don't know that eliminating the Q gene is our answer. If we don't have scrapie in the flock, you're not going to get it unless you bring it in from somewhere. So there, there's controversy on that. Some countries, like England, they do all three, and if they're in the volunteer and they get an animal that is all three, homozygous susceptible to all three, they have to send it to a terminal slaughter. They don't have the choice. Um, so there, there's different. And getting something else. A couple others drove around all over the place. Can be so there's People. a lot of pros and cons to it. We've been doing it with our rams. Um, I, I question whether I wish. we're going to continue to do it. I'm getting some buyers that want it, but a lot of buyers sure. But I would depend. I haven't decided yet. This is where a grass which is a prolific. Here. Um, you can do it from the sheep and, and uh, 
Romanoff, but they kind of give you a gradual increase in learning percentage. You increase the percentage of those breeds. They are. Yeah, an immediate shot. Um, that they a gene that turns on or turns off. It's either there or it's not. And there's some breeders like Tamarack sheep in Minnesota that are using that and reported it. Um, it's associated with some breeds like Merinos, and then what she, she spent 20 years getting the Merino traits out of her meat sheep, but keeping the Barilla gene. So it's not just as simple as bringing in Merino Barilla semen and porting, or putting it into your ewes and having it. You may have some uh, unsavory characteristics for your flock if that's not what you and want. Oh. And then there's the Calipes gene that was oh, what became popular for a while, and that's a picture of this. It's a double muscling gene, uh, similar to like the Belgian blue cattle. The but there was a lot of tenderness problems, a lot of dystocia issues with them, and you don't, you don't hear much about that anymore, but the testing is available. Spider lamb gene is, is something that some people might be familiar, particularly in the black face sheep, but it's funny how it has migrated to other breeds. Um, not sure how that happened, and I'll let you speculate how that happened, but, um, but it was first found in Suffolk, some hams, but it is in some other, I've heard of it in South Down. Truck turns over. So it's a recessive genetic skeletal disorder. The animals, if they, they either can't get up, they're like a floppy, or if they can, they just have some real, real skeletal issues. So some up and coming DNA testing, and a lot of this is coming out of New Zealand and Australia. Um, disease resistance, there's a, there's a test for foot rot resistance right now that there's some interest. I know of one breeder in Canada who's using that right now. There's a cold tolerance gene. Um, that's that's available. But, uh, I don't. I, the same breeder is is uh, currently testing for that and doing some selection. The one that interests me most right now is the parasite uh, resistance, and there's some of that happening in Australia, and we're interested in bringing some of that in with all of 58. the fifty-eight with parasites and small ruminants. But what's the cost? These tests are not are not cheap. Sometimes it's thirty yeah. to fifty dollars per animal per test. Get me going on that. Economical for a commercial shepherd, but. I think at some point we should have some seedstock people who are doing this, but realizing that there's a cost involved and, and are willing, our buyers willing to pay for the expense of it, you know, because it, it's going to get passed along. And if buyers aren't willing to pay for it, seedstock producers aren't going to aren't going to buy the it. Right here. You know, in 21st century, it's just at least important to mention predator control because it's becoming more and more of an a good with uh, a lot of our large predators that are making a comeback. I mean, we have. All of these in our area right now, including in the mountain, also, and then there is a ground on a, a game no. right now. So all of these, including the two legs. So, um, so there's many methods of predator control fencing, confinement at night protection. And you've got a con dog llamas, agent look. Uh, but it's something that for those of you who are thinking about getting into it, do one by name. How are you going to protect your animals from? You get the agent look. So the one thing that sheep have an advantage of over all other species, cattle included, we have a big one if we take advantage of it, is that we can easily finish our lambs on grass. Cattle can do it, but it takes, it takes a lot of effort. It takes you know, a big change in genetics, it takes longer period, and you may or may not have the fat cover that you want. I heard that mentioned uh, over the days here as well. But, and of course the pigs, the swine, and the poultry rely on those grain inputs, so they can't do it. We can do it, folks. So if you are trying, you can produce these animals on forage. I don't care how steep your side hill is in West Virginia. You can produce no. them and finish it on grass on, in, in, without grain inputs. You know, there's examples of some of our lambs that are about 60, 70 days old. Um, the ewes and the lambs have margin. No, those, are, those three are all twins. No grain. Oh, yeah. They're ready for a hawk. So we're going to send them. Yeah, you know, they're ready. We don't need grain for them. And if you feel their back, they're just rolling. I mean, you, can, you can't feel their backbone. That's mama's milk and grass. So a little bit of a summary. Sheep can enhance the farm's biological diversity. We have a lot of farms who have other enterprises, whether it's vegetables, whether it's cattle, whether, uh, whatever it is. They fit in well, because there's not a lot of capital investment. They don't pick up a lot of them. They're easily integrated into a farm. You know, they're a good complement with cattle, and it's easy to adapt like, internally. You know, they're, they're like mice. If you do it well, they expand You're right there, bud. quite quickly. We started with 14 ewes on our farm, and we've sold thousands off the farm now. It's, just, it's kind of astounding when you look at what you start with and what you can produce, especially if you're lambing more than once a year. So one thing I hear pretty often is I can't graze sheep on good crop ground on my full ground. Bob's laughing. You've heard that, haven't you? 
So this is a quote, and I, I didn't put the source there. It's erroneous to think that the better land should raise only one crop. I don't care what that crop is. Hence the key to making money in sheep on tillable ground is make it part of a more complex farm plan. If you're rotating your crops, put on a summer annual and grow those sheep across it, let them pug up the grass a little bit, put, aerate the ground, drop some nutrients on it, and then plant your fall crop. You know, you, you can't, it, this misnomer, I don't care if it's corn ground in Iowa, you can do this. It needs to be broken up, it needs to be in a crop rotation, a good cover crop. Let them chew it down, gr till under the rest of the, the green manure if you want, the, the rest of the residue, and then plant your crop. So you can do it. It has to be, you know, our side hills that we're scared to roll a hay bale down or, or the crappy rocky ground. It can be good ground as well. So, so commercial shepherds need to be knowledgeable about available technologies, require that information when you're purchasing stock, ask questions, and we're there. We'll add, and if the, if the breeder won't answer questions and won't take time, go somewhere else. Recognize that this testing record keeping is a cost to the seller. I spend a lot of time in front of the computer. I spend a lot of time taking samples. I spend a lot of time doing, answering questions, answering emails. And it's a cost. It's all a cost. So be willing to invest in this information. I'm not saying you need to go out and spend $5,000 on a ram. I'm not saying that at all. But be willing to pay over market costs. Over here. Good ram. And stay ahead of the game. Prepare for those lower land prices. It's bound to keep going in cyclical, you know, uh, oh, cyclical cycles is kind of redundant, but you know what I mean. It's going to be cyclical, and we want to be prepared for, you know, take advantage of the good times and be prepared for that. The and with that, I think we have, what, about five minutes? That was pretty good. Five minutes, and I can take some questions if anybody has anything. Are we doing any studies on parasite resistance? Yeah, um, t there is a oh. recipes monitor for monitoring resistance. There is an EBV for that, but it requires doing fecal egg counts on all your sheep, so it's time consuming. Um, the two things, well, the one thing we're doing, the one thing we want to do. What your cattle bring doesn't make it. We're not, and if they're wormy and they're really just wormy, I just don't, I just, you're on the call list. Um, the other thing we want to do is bring in those Australian genetics that are doing this with those EBVs, and they have some outstanding numbers on their EBVs, and um, there's another producer in Pennsylvania that has used them and has seen some differences. So those are the two things that, from a realistic standpoint, that we're doing. Bill. About 600 pound calves, all of a sudden, it's a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably something that Uh, not, you know, seven percent, and that cost two dollars and seventy-two cents, six hundred pounds for sixteen dollars. Head, I'll just write it half. Or you can say, okay, we'll go to ninety-three percent of the dollar sixty, and now we're talking about ninety-three cents a hundred, six hundred pounds, five dollars, mm -hmm. and a dollar for. Why do you do that? Because things happen. I mean, things happen. And I don't think anybody would want to ensure. But I, I mean, there, there's a lot of opportunity there for that to, uh, to, that to change. Now, as you see here, three. Because he's still proliferating in the flock. Mm -hmm. Not that you want to shop it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great point. That's right. That's right. Work. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Other questions or comments? Ah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. A female or a market for performance tested females. I've got all my females pre-sold that haven't even hit the ground yet. The females, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so right now we've got a, a notification list. Now, how many of those people follow through with the commitment? You know, when I say, okay, I'm taking deposits, but I've got a long list of females. People really want mature use, and they're impossible to find unless somebody's going out of business. They want bread use or they want mature use to breed this fall, but, you know, we sell wean lambs and they're out of here. I'm not going to keep them raising the yearlings if I can ship them once they're up far enough that I know where the selection needs to be made. At what age do we breed the yearlings? Um, it depends if they're fallborn or springborn. I, if they're fallborn, they're getting exposed at 12 to 15 months to lamb at if they if lamb in the fall at 18 months. But we want to see them. I want to see them have twins by 10 or 24 months old for us. If they don't, they're gone. You know, you can breed ewe lambs, if you, but they need a much higher plane of nutrition, and that's just a decision we have made not to do. We used to but we just decided we wanted to go all forage. So we need, and we, we did run into some issues with them being smaller weight and having some prolapse. They just couldn't carry that pregnancy. So we let them mature a little bit more. <laughs> Do we use the tree crops or star system? We use the soder system. They land when I want them to based on my schedule. With off farm jobs, it, de it depends. So we, we typically lamb in February, we typically lamb in the fall. It could be anywhere from September to November, depending on what our schedules are, but it's the Soder system. That's what I like about Dorsets. Well, I thank you for your attention. Thank you.